Thank you all for joining us on the live feed. This is going to be the fifth video of the Onyx Mapping Whitetail series. How to hunt ponds, open, open country, big woods, river bottoms. river bottoms. So we've already got a bunch of questions here on all those various topics and whatnot. What was that? Like? <laughs> that <laughs> wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Making flatulating I mean, sounds. I mean, over I here. mean we, could, we could blame it on whatever we well, want. We also really. have Mindy behind the camera here that's <laughs> holding a microphone. <laughs> Mindy's going to be helping us moderate. And yeah, we're going to get off and running here, hopefully, before the train gets too far off the tracks uh, and cover a bunch of this mapping stuff. Also, want to remind everybody if you do not have the Onyx Hunt app on your phone or your computer, you can get it and save 20%. At onyxmaps.com, just use the promo code THP. That's all caps THP. Mm -hmm. Onyxmaps.com, save 20%. But we started out with the ponds video, and that's all it was about. It was just how to hunt and map ponds. And this, this one in particular was a very classic example of what we're dealing with in our part of the world. They could be small, they could be big, but regardless, they're adding some sort of diverse element to the habitat. A lot of times, some really good bedding options. Yeah, Greg was showing some of his old footage. That was really sweet. You can see exactly what we're talking about in that footage when it comes to habitat diversity. It's like there's that 15, 20 yard buffer right along the edge of the pond where there's the, some of that marsh grass, canary grass, and stuff that's growing up before it blends into, you know, the bigger, m more mature hardwood timber. And that little strip of diversity there is still edge. You got a comment we need to address? Yes. Go. Okay. Mike Dameron says, <laughs> I say we all go on comment silence until they give us word on the ability to buy that bottomland hoodie that Greg has on. You can buy the bottomland stuff at thehuntingpublic.com. Um, we've got Tim or Mossy Oak tree stand, bottomland, and green leaf, all the old vintage camo patterns in the hoodies. But – Mike is, Mike, Mike is excited. He said he's ordering it right now. He's he's going to wear it with my Ted costume on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, there we Mike. Go. <laughs> Send pictures, please. Appreciate yes. it. Yes, that would be classic. Another advantage that I'll mention is the vegetation in and around ponds. They just, there's what, so much. Wet areas. Yeah, or something wet areas, period. Like duck potato type stuff. I mean, Dan Infall planted that stuff in the edge of ponds a few years ago and i think it grows naturally in some areas greg's filmed deer eating algae in ponds yeah, showing it right now so i i'm really intrigued by them in our area but we have a ton of diversity in our area so there's really no shortage of good spots right um so long as you have enough land to hunt there's going to be good spots whether it's private or public but if you're hunting big big woods or super monotonous open terrain pond is a really good place to start if you're it's say if you're t got a ten thousand acre chunk that all looks exactly the same and you flip that topo feature on the map you can see water sources you can see creeks you can see little lakes you can see ponds mm -hmm. a lot of times just from a map standpoint so if you're looking at a five thousand acre chunk of super monotonous dense timber and you turn that topo layer on you might be able to see a few ponds located back in that stuff You've got a couple questions asked about, it. are there better times of the year to hunt the water sources? Early season rut, does it make a difference? Is it always good? I well, that pond that I refer to was good all season long. We'd get bucks consistently coming through there. A lot of the footage I've been showing was late October. Uh, then, of course, during the rut, bucks are still coming through there, checking in and around that pond. And there was also the pond itself created trails that funneled deer around it and we had success either setting up immediately over the pond and shooting them while they were drinking or catching them funneling around it and then actually surprisingly late season and I referred to this in the, the pond video you know I showed some footage of deer that were actually still coming to that pond when it was frozen and pawing through the snow and kind of getting it some slush underneath so yeah let's go let's get to open terrain and that was an interesting video because we jumped yep. a huge buck <laughs> two <laughs> yeah not one but two yeah we jumped Two nice bucks right out of the bedding as we were talking about it. I must have been talking a little too loud because Ted goes, big buck, big buck, right there. <laughs> and he was taking off running across that field. But, yeah, that's a spot I'm super excited about. Well, if you can watch something, it's a, it's a lot easier to move on it when you can see it. And I think that, that always has a play in my, my excitement. 
Yeah. Yeah, it, it opens up so many more strategies. Mm. Observe and move in. You can spot and stock. You can mm. decoy. That's the advantage with open areas that we covered in the video pretty thoroughly is that you can see what's going on. You can get to a vantage point and you can observe the movement from a distance. You know, trail cameras are, are nice and they're handy for some things, but in a super open area like that, you're almost just better off getting up high mm -hmm. and doing a lot of long range glassing mm -hmm. to see where the deer are popping up at, where they're coming out at. And when we're going in there and we're scouting them preseason or we're looking at them from a map, we're still looking for habitat diversity. It's just different types. Yeah. Like where we jump those bucks is in a quarter acre patch of canary grass at the head of a waterway where it meets a little woodlot. A little drainage like what you guys are standing at the head of there where you know, there's just a small little patch of timber, even stuff like sumac patches, cottonwood regrowth, um, willow stands and kind of low lying areas in CRP. That's all little mini transition lines. And the, and the nice thing about looking at a map is you can see a lot of those little transitions. The more that you zoom in and you kind of look at, you know, I, I always tell people this, the more color difference there is on that map when you're looking at a CRP field, like you're seeing like little patches of maybe brown or a little bit of tan, a little bit of green. Like the more color there is, the more diversity there is. There's more yep. plants mm -hmm. that are growing right. there. And like looking at the place like where I shot that buck in Nebraska, if you look at that on a map, which we won't pull that up. <laughs> it's it right has, next to the road. Yeah. Secret spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it has like just tons of different colors. Like there's tons of different little variations in how tall the cover is what type of you know plant is actually growing there and that's the beauty of like the map and the map scouting is a lot of that you can see before you even get there therefore you get to these areas and you're looking right at them when you get to your observation stand or high point or whatever you're doing mm -hmm. you're looking right at these specific spots saying as soon as he stands up there i know what i'm going to do whether that's tomorrow or that day you know what you're doing the challenge that people have with open stuff like that is that they just don't think there's very many deer out there. So they don't even hunt it. They don't even bother with it. Mm -hmm. If if you give if you give somebody 400 acres of just open stuff with one fence row and a little woodlot running through it, or you give them 4,000 right down the road that's got a bunch of big timber and ag mm -hmm. fields and stuff, they're going to the 4,000 acre piece all the time. Mm -hmm. and they're going to look at that 400 acres and they're going to think, no, I'm not messing with that. That's for, for the bird hunters or whatever. Granted, there may be way more deer on that other piece. Total, yeah. In total. Mm -hmm. But a great big buck will be on that, you know, open country. Chomper? Chomper, that's upset about something. You can you can cut the your... fireworks. Somebody's oh. shooting off fireworks. Somebody's Jerry, shooting off fireworks. Jerry's probably got... shooting off fireworks after a long yeah. hard day of work. I guess yeah. I guess, <laughs> I, guess uh, I always say that Iowa is not just like it's like Fourth of July month, and now I guess it's going. We're going into August too. Like people just really. Yeah, June, they don't want me to get any sleep at all at night. June, 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 it's Independence August, season, <laughs> not Independence yeah, Day. Right, Independence, Independence yeah. Summer. Um, what were we talking about? We're, we're talking about uh, we're talking about open country, man. Yeah, that's awesome. right. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I was mentioning. Is like they get overlooked all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's for constantly sure. overlooked. In the little patches, like you said, that's all it takes to hold a big buck or two yep. and it may not even be there may be no trees and that's another thing you got to get out of your out of your mind like if you're hunting open country and you got a big span of land like that and you have three trees on four or five hundred acres that are big enough for a stand maybe a good idea to hang a stand in one of those trees so that you can get up high and you can see what's going on but you're probably going to have to get on the ground and go out there and shoot yeah. something or you're going to have to mm -hmm. decoy, decoy it up. in you're gonna call it, yeah. it in. you're going to have to you're going to have to be active as far as like whether you're you're staying stationary and using a decoy you got to do something to get them to come towards you because i think in a lot of those situations where you have open country the deer know where the hunters are going to be they know that they're going to be in the dang trees yeah like i've heard a lot of stories yeah. about people being like man we went out to kansas and like we saw a lot of them but they were just out in that open stuff it's like well why'd you do, why'd you watch them <laughs> right i mean i like watching them but like at a certain point it's like oh, yeah. time to move that is the issue with open country the the advantage is that you can see them from a long ways <laughs> the disadvantage is that they can see you from a long yeah. ways mm. yeah so yeah, in that if you're not aware of that then when it comes to observing and hunting, you're going to blow them out of there because they're going to they're gonna see you before you get to them. I think when it comes to open country, people are intimidated by not having trees big enough for a stand, but I think people would be 
surprised at how small of a tree that you can hunt out of and still kill deer. Oh, yeah. I think about Bryce Lambley. Oh, killing yeah. Killing a, a... Five feet mature, off the ground a lot of times. Yeah, he could have reached down and poked the deer with his longbow, and he's in a cottonwood tree that's barely big enough to get a stand in. Mm-hmm. But he's hunting in an area that other hunters had overlooked because there's no... There's no trees no big enough trees. for a stand. There's no deer out there. and It's the same thing we did in Ohio. I mean, the whole, yeah. that whole hunt, you know, Ben, before I got there, Ben called me. He's like, dude, everywhere where there's this open ground, there's nothing but, you know, maybe occasional guys running rabbit dogs. But like, he's like, there's no, everybody's parked at the big timber. Everybody. He's like, you hit that patch of stuff where it's, you know, thicker, brushy habitat, open country. He's like, there's nobody. And it's just. You know, it's easy to overlook. It's it's That's, funny. It's funny, like, we say it, but it's still the same every mm-hmm. year. The thing in this kind of go, it, it's always going to come back to habitat diversity, what we're talking about in any one of these scenarios. But the the challenge with big woods is you can't see. The diversity is much harder to see on a map. Mm-hmm. However, because there isn't as much of it, you can target specific things and go in there and and speed scout, I would say, more efficiently. If I had to pick an advantage and a disadvantage to Big Woods, that would be it. You can't see anything, so you can't observe. It's very difficult to do, but you can speed scout it. Like in this Mm. scenario, in the video that we have on the channel, we're scouting rolling Big Woods timber where there's drainages, there's creeks and stuff weaving in and out, and we're basically just going to the hubs that we find where there is a drainage or two dumping into the same spot and it's creating those hubs where you've got multiple ridges coming in from different directions. Yep. And then we're going and we're diving off of those points of the ridges and looking for bedding either in, in the bedding can occur at different spots when you're hunting in like hilly big woods like that. It can occur up high on the upper third where they're looking down below with wind base coming over the top. It can also be down in the middle of the hub itself. Mm -hmm. It's hard to figure that out until you get out there and look at it. But what we're doing on a map before we even go out there is we're looking for those hub locations where you got ridges coming in. It, It always, we use the analogy like a bicycle wheel all the time. And the spokes are the ridges. That's what your, that's your ideal scenario that you're looking for is something like that because all those ridges dumping into that hub from different directions are allowing for different wind-based bedding opportunities. You know, in that video, we scout the higher elevation in the timber and then we start scouting the ditches down to it and then the actual hub in the ditch itself. And you're seeing habitat change in there. Like I said, it's very hard to see from a map. What it is around here anyway is white oaks on top once you start falling off in elevation into those ditches, you're switching to red oaks. And then once you get clear down in the bottom itself, you're switching to some maple and occasionally locusts or elm and some other mm-hmm. things. And not saying that these trees aren't intermixed. They are. Like when we were scouting this spot the other day, there was an ancient oak tree that had fell just in the last 10 years mm. on the point of one of those ridges. But because where that oak tree dropped, all that sunlight got to the ground, and there was all kinds of high, I mean, there was beds everywhere, just on the point of this ridge. Mm-hmm. And it was such a tiny spot, you would have never saw it on a map. But if you're scouting those ridges down towards that hub, then you're seeing it. Mm-hmm. Adam McKay asked, will you tend to see those deer bedding lower on high wind days in those areas? I would say yes. Yep. And on the backside of the windy hill, like one day... Greg and I had a long conversation. We had a we had a hectic morning last year, but we got in and we had a pretty good hunt on that ridge. It was it was the same ridge that we hunted and saw the big nine pointer and the mm-hmm. big timber. Mm-hmm. And we hunted a windier day. And we hunted just to the west, and we were having a bunch of deer. We were having a northwest wind. The ridge was running east and west, so the wind's humming over the top, blasting us. But all those deer were going off the back side of that to bed on the back side of that main ridge where they were way out of the wind. And yep. we had a long conversation about how, like, that day specifically was creating really good movement because the the does were all going to that side and the bucks were cruising across the, you know, across their trails. Justice yeah. asked, "How would you hunt a hub?" get down into it or hunt up on one of the ridges depends on your wind but if we want to get right in the hub we want to hunt it on a generally speaking a calm clear crisp morning yep evening you're going to have more of a 
of thermal fall as that stuff cools down in there. But in the morning, if you have like really crisp, calm another s- sun help. Sun really makes that thermal another thing pop. that makes that that's very specific to mornings. I would say at the base of the hub is the spot where all those trails come together, and there's usually a ton of sign there, and it's a good spot. But yeah, as that's soon as those winds wind currents pick up mid morning, the day winds you're done because your your scent starts kicking around that hub and you just spook everything that's coming in there to bed. <laughs> All right. We better move on to rivers, um, but just real quick, uh, Walton asked, when you say day winds, are we talking just a couple hours of actual hunt time? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. On to rivers. Rivers are sweet, man. They're really fun to float down. They got smallmouth bass in them in a lot of states, and they're really awesome. Yeah, man. They're just an adventure every time you're on them. But anyway, as far as hunting whitetails goes. Yeah, as far as whitetails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first off, first cool thing about rivers. Access. If I had my choice, I would want it to be like a creek. Uh, just deep enough that you could float a kayak down. Mm-hmm. But not deep enough that you could get a boat in. Yeah. Sean Taylor mm-hmm. asked a good question earlier. And this, and this is pretty much what you've just been talking about. But just to reiterate here. Sean asks, with public land on a long stretch of river bottom and very limited time for boots on the ground, what are the factors you use to determine the specific sections of the river that you want to target? And this is just from a mapping standpoint, you know, before you get in there and are able to scout. But those oxbows are exactly what we're looking for. It's more specifically in spots that are harder to get to. So say, for instance, you got a public area and you can... And a river bisects the center of it, or a creek. And it's got, you know, it's got bends and meanders through there, has oxbows and such. What we're probably going to be looking at are the oxbows on that side of the river Mm -hmm. that are jutting out into the into the main channel Mm -hmm. on the opposite side from the access. Right. Another thing in that situation is like if you have to cross that water, if there's hills that fall into that river bottom, like if you're standing in the water and it's going this direction and you're looking up at a hill that's higher than that water, a lot of times the deer will bed up on those points looking yes. back down because, you know, as vegetation dies off, open river, you know, river bottoms often are pretty open. If they're up high, they can look right down at that water and see any, you know, I think, see, get out of your canoe or yeah. across mm-hmm. the water, you know. Here's a list of things you've got to think about before you go in and hunt an area yeah. with a river or a creek that are easy to overlook. If you're going in and you haven't had the chance to scout it, you have to determine how deep that river is. If there's been rain recently, which way the current's flowing, in case you want to put in one direction. A guy just asked a question a minute ago, like, what do you do when you got to paddle back upstream on a swift river? You don't. I got an answer for that. (laughs) So you got to, you have to figure out all these different things. You got to find places, maybe on a map where you can cross that river. You might be able to see riffles from a map or, you know, fast moving water where there's more shallow water, Mm -hmm. more rocks that you might be able to get across. Or where deer can cross Where deer can cross as well. These these aerial photos at this day and age is you're like down to the inch at this point. Like take advantage of that. If you can see a log going across it, maybe check Mm -hmm. and maybe that's how you can walk across it. Yes, or take it keep in mind that that might hang up your kayak (laughs) or your canoe if you're trying to get to a certain location in that river biggest thing for me though is that if it's deep enough it's going to deter people mm, yeah. it's going to deter people from accessing yeah. certain portions nick yeah. asked what do you guys do with swirling winds in and around sloughs and river bends um those are tricky certainly but and it depends on your situation but sometimes if you can get a just off wind that's blowing into the river and almost going with the current of the water it depends on how hard mm-hmm. the wind's blowing but it may take your scent right down the tunnel of the river mm-hmm. away from your stand location. I'd say a that's lot of one, times that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. We're a trying lot of to times, keep it just coming to, right down the river as best as we can. Yeah. If you can use the river itself to access, then a lot of times you can get in there without bumping a single thing. Yeah. That might be one of the few situations where we can hunt stands over and over again Mm -hmm. with water access like that because you're leaving almost zero ground scent you're parking your canoe or your kayak right below your stand and you're climbing into it and you're getting out of there this past fall in iowa like we just kept hunting that thing and just kept going deeper and deeper in there because like not leaving any scent yeah i mean minimal i mean we were getting out obviously but like 
and then we would we were kind of hunting some edges but like we just kept being able to go deeper and deeper one step further one step further because you know we're going in there not making any noise that's the other cool thing you're just not making any noise you can paddle yeah. a canoe dang quiet so. oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah a lot of times that's what that's the difference in shooting something and not shooting something you got to get over there where nobody's going and where they feel comfortable moving around where they're bedding living during the day so find a way to get over there because not very few other people are that's a fun thing about rivers or water access in general it just adds an element of adventure, ad adventure. yeah that's why i don't I mean, even, like even if it's lakes. an utter failure like our hunt last year <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a anyway, funny thing was we went to all that trouble and almost shot one 200 yards from the car yeah, yeah. go figure anyway um is there some questions we need to get to? We've been going for a ways here. We've had lots of comments coming in. That one's all. This is the one I'm excited about here. Yeah, that's a big fave there. What are you going to tell Jacob when he comes home tomorrow? I'll spit at him. <laughs> wow. Say, <laughs> like, get away from my hat. I huh? bet if you give him this in exchange, which you won't do, <laughs> um, he'd be it's fine been, with it. Yeah, that's been turkey hunting a while. It's going to be hard to. Man, I'll even look good in that thing. Dang it. Tate just said uh, <laughs> that he just found out you're his father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me Tate. too. <laughs> <laughs> Tate said, Zach, uh -oh. I just found out you're my dad. Anyway, on that note, we always like to you know, end it pretty weird if we can, and that's a good way to end it. Yeah. I like it. Check out these hats, man. They look cool. Yeah. I'm a good buddy. I've actually been noticing a lot of comments about the hair, man. Keep them coming. I'll just keep growing it. Yeah. <laughs> so the more people tell you we to know. cut it, the more you'll that's, grow it I out. Mean, that's how it will yeah. work. My whole life. That's why. It, that's why it's long in the first place. Hey, cut your hair. Hey, what? <laughs> I'll keep growing it. <laughs> Whatever, man. If it bothers you, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He's got a rebellious spirit about him. <laughs> this one. <laughs> okay, we have to go to bed. Thank you, everybody, All right. for joining us. I gotta eat. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>